Hello, online pipe community. Ethan, Parsimonious Piper here, and we are back with Across the Table. This week, we are going to hear from Father Brian about how he came to be called into the Catholic priesthood. Without any further ado, Brian, tell us your story. Thank you, gentlemen, and all those watching. The I probably I came from a background that might be a little different than most people might uh, think of, and even uh, Catholics, about becoming a priest, because uh, my parents uh, were not religious. Uh, my, I'm an only child. My uh, father was a non-practicing Lutheran, and my mother was a non-practicing Catholic, and from those two uh, came a priest. And I'd have to say that uh, my um, my mother, uh, you know, she wanted to do uh, what you know you do. You get your, you know, you as a Catholic, you get your child baptized. You go to religious education. We didn't really go to church, you know, maybe Christmas uh, and Easter. Um, my parents did divorce when I was very young, really before I could uh, remember, and. Um, so I, I, I attribute uh, my mother doing the uh, cultural thing of making sure I got the sacraments. Uh, I don't mean to uh, necessarily denigrate her, the faith that she, uh, that she had. It's not something we talked about. Um, uh, so my point being is uh, I'm thankful that uh, she saw it important enough uh, for whatever reason, for me to receive the sacraments. Now, my father's role, um, very interesting, is uh, starting in the sixth grade, he want, he for him, what was important is you get a good education. And uh, he didn't go to college, and uh, but he had a job that you could get, you could, uh, you could have a good job. Uh, he worked for a power plant and you could make good money. But I think he kind of saw that you, that if you really wanted to uh, be successful, you were going to need a college education. Now we're going back to the 70s and 80s. Um, so he did not really care for the public schools uh, at the time, or at least in our area. So he wanted me to go to Catholic school starting in the sixth grade, and uh, and I uh, and so I did, and it was quite a transition. Um, had uh, had uh, Irish nuns, Irish Sisters of Mercy. There, there's probably five or six that were there uh, from Ireland, and um, you know some some stories that uh, I always found you know I like to tell is uh, they. Uh, they saw something in me and something that I would say that I, I would never have saw myself. Um, you know, I was probably one of the only kids that, uh, that was from a divorced family at that time. So there might've been a little extra care that they would have shown to me. Um, but they were, uh, I, I truly believe that through their tough love, uh, you know, they prayed for me. They wanted to make sure I received the sacrament. Uh, excuse me, I I received the faith uh, as well as I could. Um, they knew I didn't go to church, uh, you know, uh, really. Um, one cute story I always remember. Uh, it was eighth grade, and that was the first time that I had one of the nuns for an actual. Uh, teacher, and uh, my my dad came with me. Well, it was parent teacher night, so it would have been parent nun night, and uh, and she was a short little nun, and <laughs> so my father and I were waiting outside of the classroom to go in for my turn, and she went somewhere else uh, to do something, and so she's coming down the hallway. And she's literally yelling at me and my father down the hallway, 
and she's got her finger already in the air saying, your son can do a better job and I know he can do a better job and blah, 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 blah. And she gets up to my father. She was probably five, I'm gonna guess three, four. He was six, two and she gets right in his face. She puts her finger right in his face and says, your son can do a better job and blah, 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 blah. Goes in the room and at that split, at that moment, I think I could feel either eternity, I could feel the attorney, the, I could feel the eternal aspect of heaven or it could have been hell uh, because I did not know how my father was going to respond at that moment. And he turned to me and he said, I like her. And then we walked in the room and I still didn't know if that was going to be a, my moment of touching heaven or uh, or touching hell. And but I, I mentioned this, you know, stories. There's so many stories like it is because. It's really looking back shows me how God works in such in ways that we just never, uh, never imagined. And. Now, my father continued for me to go to high school and then went to a Catholic high school. And still didn't really go to church or anything. And my father kept saying, I want you to get a good education. And as I was going through high school and I didn't want to go there, I wanted to be with my friends who were in my neighborhood because the high school is about a half an hour away. So I had school friends and I had neighborhood friends. And my first year of a freshman, a priest, a young priest was the chaplain. I had zero interest in connecting with him. I, I, looking back, I don't know if I articulated it well at the time, but he was rather immature and I just didn't have an interest. My next year, my sophomore year, a new priest came in, another priest. I think they kind of realized that this priest really wasn't ready or should have should have been a chaplain in a high school. So another younger priest came in. I was still fighting my dad to not be, uh, not to go to the, that, the school, the Catholic high school. During this time, my, uh, I was starting to notice this priest. He, he, I could tell that he loved his priesthood. I could tell, I might not have used that word, but I could tell he liked what he did. It was important to him. Uh, he respected it. He respected us uh, as students. Um, he took a lot of our dumb questions. And what I mean by dumb is, you know, sometimes we we just ask questions to see if we can, you know, pick little holes or things like that. And he was respectful at the same time. And, uh, and again, one story that I just never forget is um, we needed to pick a class day, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, club day. There's music clubs, uh, math clubs, and things like that. And this is in Florida, so we didn't have air conditioning at, at that time in the school. And I was walking with a friend, and I wanted to be in air conditioning, at least for that club. You had to go to the club day, one day a month. The mat, there was two portables that had air conditioning. Um, the math club was meeting in one and math is not my thing. So I had zero interest in volunteering to be a part of the math club. Um, but this other uh, hour was with this priest and it was called the liturgy club. And I had no idea what liturgy meant. I just thought maybe I had to read the Bible and for air conditioning, I was willing to read the Bible. Uh, for an hour so I walked in there's some juniors and seniors so kind of around him talking and joking I went and sat in the back corner and it was about because we we didn't have a church near the near the um near the high school so we had to have mass at liturgy which are in the in the auditorium in the gym and it really was unappealing it was it was a gym um so I, so we basically, he was trying to get students to help decorate and make it look more like a church worthy of giving worship to God as 
we would see for in Roman Catholicism, you didn't have to stick with it. You just had to go to the club day. So we were done. I was ready. I was walking out with, with zero interest of helping on off times. And the senior girl comes up to me, knows my name, says, Brian, I'm so glad you're here. You're going to stick with it, right? She was pretty. And I just found myself saying yes. And before I knew it, I stuck with it. And that long story short, I got to know the priest. I started to go to mass. There was a morning mass early in the morning before school. You didn't have to go. I started to go with some of the other guys. Still didn't go on the weekends. And then a God moment, a Holy Spirit moment, when I was in the school towards the end of the sophomore year, I remember thinking, maybe I should start going to Sunday Mass, to Sunday liturgy. No one was asking me to go or anything like that. And so I went to the local church where I went to middle, uh, middle school and went in there. But I should say, funny story is, you know, this was at a time where you didn't have your own car. I borrowed my father's car. And so I had to ask him permission to use the car. And I remember saying, Dad, can I borrow the car? And of course, his answer was, why? I said, well, I'd like to go to Sunday Mass. And he was quiet and he goes, really? Long story short on that, I don't know if he didn't believe me, but he drove me to mass. He didn't go in, he waited, because he didn't know if he believed I was actually gonna go. I didn't leave there enlightened uh, necessarily. Um, I felt like I did something I should do. And I, wanted to stay in the school and my calling was really little by little little acts of faith where i was answering god's call without realizing it because at the end of my sophomore year i really my dad at one point said to me do you really want to go to the local high school and i knew at that split moment I had him. I knew I wore him down. And I, the words out of my mouth was, no, I'll stay. And as I was, as I was saying that, I didn't understand why I was saying that. <laughs> I had fought for two years to not go. And here I was saying, I'll stay. I did not understand it, why I was doing that or saying that. But I can look back and see God's movement, see acts, you know, a building of faith. And now I will say a part of this calling, because those who are familiar with Roman Catholicism know that we take a promise of celibacy. And when, especially, well, when Richard uh, uh, speaks, I'm not saying he's going to say this, but uh, there's a little difference. Uh, and actually, even of your traditions and the Protestant traditions, um, there's slight differences of, of, of that tradition. And I, can't, I cannot honestly say I knew to the full extent at a high school age, because I went in to seminary right after high school. Um, so I can't say with full knowledge i knew exactly what i was getting into but at the same time a purpose of seminary is to learn to be formed to grow in your your faith and to discern is this something that one you want to do and do you want to answer uh, god's calling is god calling you to this vocation um to this sacrifice and uh, in all of us, in our own as in our own traditions, our any vocation is a sac is a is a sacrifice, and it's a beautiful sacrifice. Whether it's the sacrifice of marriage, there's a beauty to it, and to uh, and to priesthood. 
I, I say that because my non-Catholic, non-practicing Lutheran father pulled out all the Catholic guilt cards that that he could. Because <laughs> now I will give my parents, now both of my parents had zero interest in me taking this, this journey. And I remember telling them both separately because I said they were divorced. And I remember not saying things to them like, I'm definitely going to do this. I started, the interest started to be, and I asked the priest, I said, how do you do what you do? How do you become that? And of course, I'm asking a very simple question that's not a simple answer. So he took time to talk about it over time. And, and one of his answers was, I'll share with you, but he goes, why don't you continue to observe how I live my daily priesthood. That was, I never thought of that. He goes, you've observed me, continue to observe and ask me questions. And that'll be, and he goes, that's going to be helpful. So I remember my father one time, cause he helped me. I had to drive around to different places to meet different people, to be interviewed and so forth. Because in Roman Catholicism, when, if a diocese, the church, I'll, I'll just say it, we only have so much time. When they say that you are accepted to be a seminarian and to study, they are taking financial responsibility in my tradition for you. They're going to pay for your schooling. They're going to pay for your health in most places. This is not equally across the board, but they're going to take responsibility for you. So you don't go into seminary in Roman Catholicism as an independent contractor. You don't go as an independent. They have to sponsor you to be able to, to, to do this. And so I had to go through a lot of interviews. And my father really drove me around to meet all these different people uh, to be interviewed. And I look back and realize that was a testament of love and a faith on his part, even though I still would have been a pretty bratty 17 year old who, who wouldn't have seen it that way. Um, but I can look back, but I remember one specific time he says, he goes, you know, you're not going to be able to get married if you, if you, if you, if you go on with this. And to talk back to my father was not something I normally did because let's just say I would have felt the back end of a, of a hand. Um, but I remember saying, well, dad, that's not my fault. That's your fault. You should have had more kids. As I said it, and the words were going out of my mouth, I couldn't believe they were coming out of my mouth. And I think my father saw me as an adult because he did not raise his voice or anything like that. Um, I don't know how he processed much of this because we didn't talk about things really a lot uh you know we didn't process emotions or anything like that but but he was concerned the because i'm the i'm the only i'm the last male leonard my last name so my so our name in my bloodline that we know does not continue on um and uh, so I'm not saying I appreciated these times at the moment, but as I've grown in faith and as I'm still growing in faith, I'm able to look back and appreciate how God has worked through my father and mother, who I can honestly say I did not appreciate as I should. And maybe we might say that of teenagers and so forth, but I'm able to look back and appreciate how God worked through my non-Catholic, non-practicing Lutheran father and my non-practicing uh, Catholic, uh, Catholic mother. Um, and so that's really, in a nutshell, how that calling grew, uh, you know, to that point. And I'll just mention, because obviously we don't, I want to keep this uh, within uh, certain limits, but I'll just mention two different points, one in seminary itself. Now, seminary for us 
if you and going out of high school is not the norm. Most don't mo most don't make that decision. Um, so it was eight. It it actually it took officially nine years uh, to become a priest. Four years of minor seminary, which is college, and it's accredited college. But you go to a place where and there's and there's more than one um, where other men are discerning the same thing. And then there's major seminary, which is graduate level, um, and that's four years. But one year. And this is not across the board for everybody, the one year. One year is a pastoral year in an actual parish before you're ordained, usually a deacon. Before a deacon, then you'd be ordained a, uh, a priest. And in my seminary years, there's a lot I could talk about. But I'll say one of the, the greatest eye-opening moments was when I was with the, my spiritual director, and I was complaining, this was in graduate major seminary, so I was getting close. And I was complaining to him, whatever. I mean, I was being treated unfairly, you know how you, we, when we're young, we know everything. Um, so I was going on for 20 minutes with this older priest and he didn't say a word. And after 20 minutes, I realized he hadn't said a word. So I finally stopped and he goes, are you done? <laughs> And I said, yes. And he goes, you do know you can leave. And I kind of knew he didn't mean in the room, but I said to him, what are you talking about? He goes, you don't have to be here. No one is for, God isn't forcing you to be here. I'm not forcing you to be here. If it's that bad, you can leave. And I'm sure we talked for a little bit. And I went away for a few days licking my wounds, but it hit me. I could leave. And when I was able to surrender that and stop being a victim, I was able to accept this calling and say, no, I truly believe God wants me to be here. And the freedom to be able to say it was very powerful. And there's different moments, but there was a very powerful moment in my discernment. Um, I didn't have to do this, it, but I true I believe God's calling, but I had to get rid of that victimization, that poor me, that pride. And then I'll say one is priesthood, and I've been a priest now for 24 years, um, and I'll say one big moment of men is when I realized that God did not call me, and this was a number of years into being a priest. God did not call me to be a priest personally because I'm going to do great things for him and I'm going to save his people. It hit me that God called me to be a priest because that's how I'm going to be saved. I mean, I'm going to find my personal relationship with Christ through this calling. And it was so humbling. Part of it, I, I don't know if I was embarrassed in myself that I was going to save the church and I was going to be all this wonderful things for people. And I had, and I, I knew it came from a scripture reading and I, I, I want to say it was, you know, God calling the apostles and realizing he didn't call these apostles because they were worthy of anything. If anything, we know through the scriptures, they were not worthy. God didn't call me because I was worthy. He called me because he called. Me. And this is how he is going to. This is how he is going to bring me to himself. And then hopefully through that calling and humility other people, hopefully, therefore, then can see Christ through how he is saving me and calling me. So I think in a nutshell, that's what I'm going to stick with. Uh, that's absolutely uh, beautiful, The your, your closing statement there, because I was going to ask, uh, when you went from uh, an unchurched young boy 
uh, to a priest, I, I was going to ask, you know, was there a point along the way where it dawned on you? I believe this stuff. This stuff makes sense to me. It's real. Um, and that's a very good question. And you know what I'm realizing now is I continue to have those moments <laughs> where, where I think, because you know, and I go back to different things. Like I think of the the screw tape letter journey that we're on, right? And, and and even looking at this last one, the one we did, which I should I don't was about the present, the past, and the future. Uh -huh. And it's like when I stop trying to control and tell God this is how things need to be done. Of course, I don't do that that consciously, but mm -hmm. I'm I. He shows me in the present, I, I've already taken care of it. And so those moments come more and more. And I think I'm getting a little more comfortable with them. I'm getting a little less embarrassed personally that I didn't get it. Um, but I continue to have those, uh, those moments. Yeah, that, that really is that. Uh... Beautiful, beautiful testimony to God's working in your life. Um, Richard, do you have any questions or anything to add there? No, uh, I have to say that I have experienced the very same uh, thing about this is what it is taking for God to save me, is, is the priesthood. Because... I don't know that I would be saved without it. You know, he deals with each of us as he deals with us. Yep. And uh, uh, it's not that we're specially good. And it's not that we're specially bad either. Mm -hmm. It's just that this is what it took to get to us. And... Uh, there was there was a lot in Father Brian's uh, uh, story that I certainly identified with, and uh, hearing it, why well, I am, you know, if if I weren't such an embarrassing person, I would say out loud that I'm even prouder to call him my brother, <laughs> but I wouldn't want to embarrass him by by, <laughs> by saying that. Well, well, thank you. Oh, go ahead, Brian. No, thank you, uh, you know, both uh, very much. And, you know, I'm looking forward myself to hearing, you know, both of your, uh, you know, journeys to, uh, yeah, both of your, uh, both of your journeys and appreciative to be able to, you know, to share mine. And, uh, you know, obviously that's a quick nutshell of so many uh, you know, so many aspects that could be, uh, that could be shared, but, um, I'm actually, you know, happy that I'm at this part of my life and priesthood where, uh, we could be doing this video and zooming because I'm actually appreciative. I, I am so happy that when I was a young man, I hate to say it, I'm so glad we didn't have social media then because I'm happy that for, I'm happy you know I don't know how younger people than this I don't want to go this could be a whole nother rabbit hole but I feel for a lot of these young men and I'll speak from my own tradition because I was for five years I was the vocation director and a director of seminarians which means I was in, I was the bishop's representative on recruiting. I'll use the secular word yeah. on recruiting men, just like myself. And it is a totally different world to recruit. And I did not have the scrutinies. I I did not have the opportunities to mess up that. Unfortunately, so many young men today have to be scrutinized. And when I was leaving my position of vocation director, I remember telling the bishop, 
I said, Bishop, because he said with your, you know, your five years of doing this, he goes, what, 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 what do you, what do you think? What's your advice? Um, and I said, Bishop, I said, young men who are going to come to desire to be priesthood are coming with a whole set of different problems, concerns that I said, I'm even too old right now to really understand. And I said, and I am just personally happy I did not have to deal with them because my point in the whole thing was, I'm glad I'm at the age right now to be able to talk to both of you and the internet world. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, folks, I, I certainly hope that you have enjoyed this as thoroughly as we have. If you have, we're going to continue this with part two when we have Sir Richard telling us his story. Uh, and, and then a part three, if we still have any viewers by then, when I tell, when I tell mine. Until then, I'll tell you what I love to tell you, but I'm going to give it a little twist. Like something you like. Let's seek Christ together. See you next week. <laughs>